Welcome back to another edition of the Dirty Verdict Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Peter Taff. Hola, mis amigos. I am Pal Herbert, a full-time host and full-time litigator of the Dirty Verdict Podcast. Hi, everybody. I'm Bill Ogden, full-time litigator, and I apologize in advance for anything that comes out of Kyle's mouth. Kyle's been practicing his uh, radio voice. Yeah, on Telemundo. I can see that. I've been listening to Barry White. I've been doing a lot of, like, podcast videos this morning. But uh, I'm feeling pretty normal and awesome, and I'm ready to induce, introduce these amazing guests. All right, we have two very special guests. We've got Kelly Victorin and Laura Gomez Duarte. Yes, from the yes. yeah from the law firm of Armstrong Lee and Baker. So thank you for joining us. Um, wait, you're not impressed with Kyle? <laughs> at all? I mean, they both jumped like, "Hello!" Oh. What's so, he looking at? I realized that you guys work there. Yes. Awesome. That's fantastic. I think the head. Uh, Al does a lot of background research. I'm very diligent about that. And so I've actually had dinner with all of y'all's principals, mm-hmm. but with neither of you two. And it took us like a good 30 minutes to figure out how to pronounce everybody's last name, which is awesome. But we finally got it going and we're ready to rock now. Well, sometimes they have to just keep you away from everybody else. Not sometimes. That's fair. All times. So... So this came up because we try to cover different legal topics that uh, of of interest, and um, I mediated a case with Kelly that was a workplace injury that was ultimately a bench trial. I think it was a. So you did uh, not do your job. I did. It was not successful in that. But as I do, I, I check at, at cases that don't settle. I go and look online and follow up with people. Hey, I see it's still pending. Anything I can do to help? Do you use that as ammo? As a what? Do you use that as ammo? Like, people don't settle a case. Oh, yeah. But, but you watch, and then you go back, like, six or seven, and you're like, told you. I told you this is your best last chance. Right? No. No, not at all. Oh, oh, man. Ammo is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep bothering you if you don't settle, so you okay. better settle. I thought, you know, I, I was with Kyle. Like, if, that, if they get rung up at trial or something, yeah. and you just, you, you get in the end zone, Peter, you dance. Yeah. But no, I, I just went and looked to see what was going on, and I saw that they had obtained a very sub- substantial judgment, and it reminded me that just I've mediated with Kelly and her firm multiple times these workplace injury cases, which are very unique. Um and so I asked Kelly if she'd come on, and Laura was also involved in the trial, so Laura came on. And just to talk about, we can talk a little bit about that case, but also just in general, I think lawyers and non-lawyers need to understand what happens if you're hurt at work, what your remedies are. If you're a lawyer uh, who has a client come in and you say, you know, we all think, oh, workers' comp, you're covered, you know, we send them to a workers' comp lawyer, not always the case anymore. There's alternative. I don't even know a workers' comp lawyer. Yeah. Actually, I do know one now. He referred me a big case, but other than that, I don't. Yeah, there, there are very few people that specialize in it because it's just very difficult and it's very administrative. Ryan Pig, I think, did it on the defense side, one of our former guests. <sighs> but there's a but, but, this, but what, what y'all do is stuff that's outside of the workers' comp, formal, administrative, because not every, you're not required in Texas. I think it may, Texas may be one of the only states that does not require everyone to get comp coverage. And so there's a whole also in Texas comp is optional, right? But if you choose not to subscribe to comp, you waive almost all of your traditional common law defenses. Ooh, Kyle, Kyle, come in with the knowledge, Kelly. Ask him a question and stump him real quick. There's like that's all. That is his breadth of not breadth of knowledge. And looked there's a lot of smart people have sat around this table. I'm not one of them. I know a handful of things, but I'm pretty sure I know that. that but, that's right. But as Kelly, a lawyer, will tell us, there's. Some of them are subject to arbitration. There's an arbitration clause. Some of them have a no jury trial, um, sure. waiver of jury trial. There's different forms. So I thought before we got into that, we could just do a quick little background on y'all and how y'all got to where you are today. So Kelly, sure. start with you. I know you're from Virginia. Is that right? That's right. Um, so I grew up in Northern Virginia, which is about 30 yep. minutes south of D.C., I was going to say, is that D.C.? Yeah, so my area code is 703, which oftentimes gets confused with 713. Um, But I was born and raised there, and then I did my undergrad at Clemson. So I'm a big Clemson Tiger fan. Uh, I slowly made my way down south. Um, And after I graduated from Clemson, I moved to Austin, which was super fun. What did you do in Austin? Wow. Nothing. I had fun. Um, I spent my summer going to the lake, having fun with some friends, and then 
essentially my dad said, all right, your time is up. It's time for you to get a job, a big girl job, and put that degree to use. So my first job I got was here in Houston. So that's how I ended up here. Um, I did marketing at LRQA, and I was essentially in charge of designing their website, which was not something I went to school for. So it was interesting, but I knew at that point in time that was not something I wanted to do long term. So I looked into going to law school, uh, took my LSAT, and I went to South Texas. So, and she was so she was annoying. She was so to say, who <laughs> oh, well, was the most said mine. Yeah, you guys know each other before tonight. We were in the same section. Yeah, yeah. you have to sign a waiver and disclose that for a year and a half. We sat in the same room every single day, and she's like called out. She would like sit in the front, ask real smart questions, and I was in the back, still trying to figure out how she came to that question, much less the answer. It was you I hated this law school. Yeah, I'm like she's definitely on a scholarship or something. Yeah. Like I, it was it, that was, but when I started law school there. The first day I quickly, for the first time, was like, You're, I am not the smartest person in the room anymore. I'm really tough. She had signed up just to embarrass you. I, yeah, we hadn't met yet, but I could tell she, she was, that's why she was there. And, and so that will continue through this evening, but go ahead with you. Now. Sure. <laughs> okay, so Kelly, you blow through law school because you've got some competition that's a little wasn't me. less than, <laughs> yeah, 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 it wasn't me. Uh, but you do well in law school. And where's your first job out of school? And so I actually, I didn't know anything about law school. So my first semester, um, I didn't even know about outlines or anything. And I ended up getting okay grades, but like B minuses. And so I missed that window for big law, which looking back on it, I'm like, thank Thank God, God. right? You know, Bill's probably in the same boat as me. But, um, you know, back then you're like, what do you do now? Um, You know, you missed that window. You didn't get any interviews with any of these big firms. Um, But I ended up powering through it and I did very well the rest of law school. Um, but my first job uh, was with David Berquist. I don't know if you guys. Sure. Yeah, he's, he's got a, he has to have the largest plaintiff's firm in the city. So when I very worked large. for him, he calls me the OG. There was only three lawyers and he was in a little office off of I-10 and Katy Freeway. Um, and so um, I started there and he did a lot of pre-litigation car wreck cases. So I started there, and then I ended up, a recruiter contacted me about a position at Arnold and Aitken, and that was like my dream job, Sure, right? Um, So I interviewed with Kurt and Noah um, at the firm, and then Jason called me because he was out of town doing something. He called me about a week later and did like a phone interview with me, and somehow I got the job. Um, So... I was at Arnold and Nick Kim for about two and a half, maybe three years. And then I made the switch to Abraham Watkins. And I stayed there for about four and a half years. I worked primarily under Benny and Brant, mm-hmm. our great guys over there. Yeah, sure. Yeah, Benny's okay. Yeah. Brant's great. Uh, I, no, I'm kidding. Benny I love is. Benny's. Like, Benny's a close friend. Yeah, we're uh, I know. Benny is, he was like my mentor over there. He's, he's such a good guy. Um, and then, uh, so I worked with Scott Armstrong, who's my current boss, at Arnold Nitkin first, and then he went to Abraham Watkins, and then I went to Abraham Watkins, worked with him there, and then he started his own firm. So I always knew we're like very good friends. Uh, we've known each other and worked together for about seven years or so. So I always knew I was going to make the jump over there, and I called him after I had my first uh, baby, and I said, hey, you got a spot for me? Like, <laughs> Open it up. So mm-hmm. I've been over there for, uh, I think it's going to be four years in September. Okay. Yeah. Very good. And aside from the workplace stuff that we'll talk about, do you handle other types of cases too? Yeah. So um, like at all the places, um, we deal with catastrophic injury cases, oil cases, products cases, um, you name it. So, um, but one of our, I would say at Armstrong, Lee and Baker is, uh, that niche is kind of a specialty area is the non-subscriber cases, which I had not handled at Arnold and Atkin or Abraham Watkins. So doing any type of arbitration or um, workplace injuries was definitely new to me. Um, and Sounds so terrifying. It was, it was a learning curve for sure. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, most lawyers are like, arbitration agreement, I'm out. You know, like most people don't want to deal with that, but... Um, once I learn more about it, I'm, I'm like, okay, it's it's actually not as bad as most lawyers necessarily think. The only thing I know about arbitration is something about AAA. That's it. 
I've never been in one. I never want to be in one. But I, I said the same thing about bankruptcy, and here I am. So. Like, Triple A is one of them, and JWA. Uh, yeah, that's what I was about to guess that. <laughs> Got another buzzword to throw out there. Next time somebody throws out, I was like, oh, I was in a JWA the other day. What a rough one. Yeah. I don't even know what that means. I don't even know that makes sense. Yeah. Well, I'd say <clears throat> arbitration, one, typically on the workplace, does the employer pay the arbitration fees? Yes. Okay. So that's uh, one. You don't have the expense. Yeah. So, I mean, other than the filing fee, which is like 300 350 which is almost the same as- What do you file it? State. So you, you have to file it, uh, the complaint, you file a demand either wherever they say that the arbitration agreement says. I got you. If it says, hey, this is subject to the AAA, to the JWA, to the Texas- files it Congress. in a- district court and then they remove it and then you're like if you're gonna make me pay this i was gonna say i think professionals who do this all the time don't just don't waste you, time you on the court thing as a district yeah. i mean it depends on what the arbitration agreement says if there's a reason that we think that this maybe doesn't apply or if there's you know a way to get out of it. a way to get out of it exactly see peter so, but if if we know in our clients like hey i signed this and and we think it you know, meets all the boxes, then we just file it directly into arbitration. Yeah. And, and Kyle, to be fair, I was the lawyer when I did it that I was like, surely we're going to get around this arbitration clause. We're going to file it. We'll file it in state court. And then they'd come in hot with all their law and stuff. And I was like, oh, we have to be strong. Yeah. We're going to get arbitration. Makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Uh, okay. So very good. Laura, we'll turn to you. Where are you from originally? So I'm originally from Bogota, Colombia, but my family and I immigrated when I was very little to Houston. So I've mostly grown up in Houston. I grew out, uh, I grew up in Katy, West Houston, and I went to. And w- well, hold on, where is Katy? Katy is like 30 miles west of okay. Houston. Okay, I mean, I can install, it's, it's right, called, right before we're right. Adams territory. Yeah, I was gonna say right before Austin. I know where Bogota and Medellin are. From That's Na- impressive, but not Katy, huh? I've been to Bogota. To be fair, my I do. my firm is like 18 employees of which like six are in Medellin and two are in Bogota. But I'm not 100% sure where Katie is because I'm not, it's, these aren't, these are my, I, I don't understand. This is really fun because Kyle just referred to them as employees. And so anything that they do on the job, he's now responsible for because my, they're not contractors. They're probably my independent contractors, but you see how this works? This is their territory they're in. I see that in Spanish because I feel like that would be the most important thing. Well, I'm not sure because I think in uh, Colombia they might speak Portuguese. They do not. God damn it. Good try. No, <laughs> Good try. Uh, no I, I've been to Bogota. I've been to Cartagena. I've been to Medellin. Of course you have. Are you... You're, you're rolling your head right no, now, aren't no, you? No, I don't, I don't get... I'm, a, I'm just a dealer. I don't... But a lot of this you have back at your... You don't tap your own supply. Actually, like, I was terrified when I went because, like... From American, from an American standpoint, like Colombia is still like 1980 Colombia. That's what people think. And then you get there and you're like, it's not. Nobody's doing drugs, right? There's not. I didn't even see one you gun. There and they're like, Bill, totally changed. Calm down, Pablo. Yeah, like Medellin is a party city and like a huge tourist attraction. Not necessarily for Americans we, as much as like South America. We've we it's really awesome. disparaged your homeland long enough. Sorry about that. I've been fl- I'm very, I, I flatter. I, I love as an international city, like along the lines of Paris or Rio de Janeiro. It's actually called the Athens of South America. Yeah. It's got one of the most number of libraries for the amount of inhabitants that there are. And so, you know, people still have this image of a 1980s Colombia, but it's not that way. And the tagline for the country is that is actually the only risk is wanting to stay. Because like Bill said, it's oh my God. Yeah. Hold on. The only risk is wanting to stay? That's right. Because you get hooked. Let's get go. Hooked. We get hooked. So let's go. You get, Kyle's been hooked on Colombia before. Yeah. is great. It's on a tour. <laughs> so it's Central Time Zone, which is probably why a lot yeah. of outsourced, you know, stuff from yeah. U.S. is here. Because you're on the. We really do. We have uh, employees in Medina Bogota. Contractors. We meet every morning at ten thirty, like in the morning. They're like these are like college educated, super awesome folks. And so I'm a big fan of Colombia. We are great people. I like to say. Yeah. <laughs> So we grew up in Katy, and they were Katy. Where, where'd you go to college? I went to UT Austin for my undergrad. Okay, there we go. And the only exposure I ever had to law was my immigration attorney. Mm-hmm. So that's what I thought I wanted to do. And I did Latin American studies, uh, studied abroad because I wanted to do the whole thing. And then I graduated law school, and I worked at an immigration law firm, and it sucked. Um, was that was that was that in Houston? Where'd you go to law? School? Houston. Where'd you go to law school? I went to UH. Okay. So I worked at an immigration law firm for about two and a half years, and I decided to go to law school. And we should also join. Law. You, 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 no, no, the law, the immigration firm. I if you, if you cover your eyes, she can remember. Yeah. Yeah. 
can you cover your mic? I'll be able to see. Smith and Sharon Law Post Association. Okay, so you, I'm okay, go, I'm Googling. It wouldn't be anything. It's a firm. That's that's just a very form. Uh, oriented kind of practice and administrative and not super exciting. It is, Probably it's rewarding. But. Right, right around the time that Trump got elected, and not to get into politics, but I think everyone can agree that it, it made immigration pretty difficult. <laughs> um, and you know, it, it was just tough, and the amount of work that there was and the gain, it just just wasn't fair. And it, I realized it wasn't something that I wanted to do, and I was taking the cases home with me. So I went to law school at UH, um, and I thought I wanted to do employment because it was somewhat adjacent to immigration. And then I actually started working for a defense firm out of call, uh, out of law school. I did that for about a year and a half, and now I'm at Armstrong Lee. Which defense firm? Boris Sater, Seymour and Peace. Oh, okay. Boris, E-O-R-Y-S. Yeah. Where'd you go to undergrad? I'm sorry, I missed this. You did ah. I know. There, we go. there we go. She's got the same pedigree as me. Yeah. Which is why she's... Do you drive a Lambo as well? Because... Not yeah. <sighs> Have you ever played defensive back or free safety? Is that football? Uh, so Peter, Peter's uh, Peter's son's the starting safety for uh, the University of Texas. Yeah, you know, he's in the rotation. So. Yeah, he was he was maybe great. in some special team play. Great, what it last year? I will root for it in it, and I will root for the Longhorns. Thank you. That's as far as I. We will also in the orange team. The but, yeah, we will you. also in return we're like root for the Colombian soccer team. Yeah. Thank you. We, if you want us to to the finals. No, they're very good for Copa. Yes. And we'll root for Clemson as long as they're not playing us in playoffs. They're, our little our friend, uh, their quarterback is a is a Westlake kid. Good be for tough because it's two orange teams. Did you go to any? Uh, did you go to the Columbia game here that they hosted? Yeah, I went uh, to the first one. I think it was in June. I mean, it's Paraguay. Yeah, and we won that. Who's the famous Colombian guy with the giant like blonde afro? The soccer player. Yeah, and Bebe. Could yeah, could be. Oh, Kyle said could be. So that means he heard what you said. Say what she just said, Kyle. I try to follow soccer, and I'm. Well, he doesn't play anymore because that oh, was yeah, like. Yeah, no, I got okay. It. Okay. Okay. Anyway. I was like, I think it was Pele. Is is that a soccer player, Pele? I, you know, I watch a lot of shows. Uh, Pele's Donald Trump's favorite soccer player. How dare you? Okay. Anyways, move. Okay. On. So let, let's let's speak of Muslim bands. Cool. Let's talk about this workplace stuff. We'll use your your trial as kind of a, a template to kind of or a base to go off. So in this particular case, um, your client was working for a, like a rent center, I think, or a, a place like that. Yeah. So uh, the defendant was in the business of leasing used vehicles okay. um, to individuals, and it was kind of that motto: no credit, no problem. Mm -hmm. Um, and along with that business, uh, they were also repossessing the vehicle, um, when these people didn't make their monthly payments. Um, and the reason why that kind of comes into play is because our client's incident involved a gate. And so these, they had various locations throughout Texas. This one was in Houston, Um, But the whole premises is surrounded by these heavy black iron gates that are opened in the morning when they're in business and closed at night to prevent these individuals from coming to try to take their cars back that had been repossessed. Um, So um, kind of, you know, interesting business model, (laughs) if you'll say. But, um, yeah, so... And um, so her employer was not a subscriber to the Texas Workers' Compensation Program, meaning they did not buy workers' compensation insurance for their employees. And therefore, the remedy for an injured worker was what? Yeah, so um, because they chose to not be, um, they were a non-subscriber, um, their, the law is actually very favorable because the te- Texas legislature like Kyle mentioned, uh, penalizes employers who choose not to provide workers' compensation for employees. So it strips some of their common law defenses like contributory negligence, assumption of the risk, um, if an injury is caused by another employee's negligence. And, and contributes down to like 1%. That's exactly. So that's that, right. that 1% rule comes if you've ever heard that. So Um, An employee could be 99% um, at fault, but if the judge, arbitrator, or jury finds that the employer is just 1% responsible for this injury, then they're on the hook for all of the damages. Um, And so it's it's very favorable for 
um, an injured employee in those situations. Uh, in this case, there was no arbitration agreement, um, which is why we filed in state court. We landed in Judge Miller's court. Um, right. and Great judge. Yeah. Bo Miller. Uh-huh. It was that, for me, I think he's a great judge, but we also say that you could say the worst judge in Harris County, and we would all say, <laughs> great. I, I just say, I would say quiet. So, uh, but in your case was tried to the bench. Was there a waiver of jury trial provision somewhere? So, yeah, kind of interesting. So we, it was supposed to be a jury trial and about a month or so before, uh, opposing counsel, who was out of San Antonio, he was a solo, um, at one of the status conferences said, Hey, would you ever consider waiving the jury, uh, and trying it to the bench? Uh, and I said, are you fucking yeah. crazy? <laughs> in in yeah. Miller's court, for sure. And I, I, hold on, I want to make sure. I want to make sure that you guys can beep this out. He asked for a bench trial on Miller's court, and you said, "Are you fucking insane?" No, you. He went. I have to talk to my client. I I actually did. <laughs> and then, well, let me let me think about that and get back with you. Is this you thought it was a trick question or something? Okay, I said, has he been sued for malpractice yet? <laughs> Oh, there's been some. Here. There's been some big verdicts out of Miller's court. Yeah, the rest of the story, because this guy. No, so I, I, I literally had a non-subscriber case that went into arbitration and they got kicked back to court mm-hmm. with a defense lawyer from San Antonio. I'm tickled pink to see if it's the same guy, but uh, you guys fire away. This sounds awesome. Tickled pink. Didn't have that on my bingo cards. So this person. That that's not necessarily. A horrible offer because jury's, jury's gonna punish you too. Yeah, juries can do. It's a lose lose. And, and Judge Miller is a very <clears throat> sensible. He's gonna be very careful. <clears throat> he's not gonna go wild and crazy though. So that's not. A, I can't say that's a horrible offer. I have found that in Judge Miller's court, he loves the creative scholarly argument, especially if you do it the right way. He he likes to like have those like scholarly discussions and arguments and. So if you're like well prepared and you write well, he's going to reward it. All right. So you stipulated to this. What happens next? So it was a one day bench trial. We called multiple witnesses, moved quickly. Um, We didn't have any experts. Um, Why would you? Did you agree to do the medical stuff on affidavits or depot testimony? They did not dispute um, our past meds. Uh, we did not ask for future meds. Um, I did call her podiatrist live who testified she had permanent nerve damage and would suffer in chronic pain for the rest of her life. Did she have like drop foot or a broken ankle or? So she had a crush injury um, to her, her, her right foot. Um, there was a puncture wound on the top, but what ended up happening is she ended up getting um Basically, her peroneal nerve, the deep and the superficial, was partially torn. Um, and so he performed surgery and did a decompression on that. But that's as good as it was going to get. So the gate, I, I assume, and maybe I missed this, but the gate came down on her foot and barely missed her head? So it actually came off the track and basically fell on top of her right foot. Teeth. Um, so... It was um, a bad, really bad injury, and she was very young at the time. So she was 39 at the time of the incident, 43 at the time of trial. Um, and so we, you know, pulled out the vital statistics report, and it showed she had basically half of her life left. Um, and her doctor said she's going to have to utilize a cane. So she was, she has to use a cane to get around. Um, so the very, very large um, award from the judge was for future impairment. Um, and that was based on her son's testimony, the doctor's testimony, and then obviously our client's testimony about all her mobility issues and everything she's going to suffer for the rest. So what was the total verdict? Um, it was just in excess of $4 million. And what was the pre-trial offer? If you're allowed to say. Oh, you could because you got our verdict. So it's, yeah, we're not court. We're not talking um, this bill. Well, like, I think it, um, I, I think it was like 15 Thousand fifteen thousand American dollars. Yeah, I think so. And then they stipulated to go try this case in front of Bob Miller, mm-hmm. and then it was it. Well, that's that happened. So, um, how did y'all break up, divide up the trial responsibility? Sure. So, um, and so this was Laura's first trial. Um, Hold on, Jesus. Before we go to that, Laura, congratulations. Yeah, 
Is that some same some monsters of meat eater, right? So Peter has to sit here and say, like, well, you know, there's a lot of risk coming both sides. <laughs> but you think about it. I only do. I only win four million dollar verdicts from me and Bill. What a verdict! Congratulations. That is you know, that's incredible. That is a great verdict. So and and but do you realize now, like, they don't happen every day. That's not how everyone goes. <laughs> Like how many times can you say your first trial you get a four million dollar you know judgment and so for me it's zero they tack on interest it didn't happen to me either they what, what was the final judgment with interest um so i don't this is a, a four years on four, and, and interest rates four, are big four and five four and change i mean i don't i know it was we knew the math so uh, the question i did have earlier it took four years to get to this was that because of the harvey covid backup or is that typical no, so that was um, well. At some point, opposing counsel filed a continuance, which I opposed. But they had a sub of attorneys, so there was about. So they brought in a second group of lawyers to come get their heads kicked in. Yeah, so one withdrew, uh, and then someone else subbed in, um, and so Judge Miller was like, "I need to grant this continuance and let this guy get up to speed." Um, and so I said, okay. Um, so, but he only reset us for like, it was like a, a minor, cont- it was only a few months. Um, but when we waived the jury, it was like, hey, we can do that extra. like Friday. And I'm yeah. like, okay. Two days. You can do that on a docket call. So, so how did you guys divide up these trial responsibilities? Who handled what? What brought it home to this massive verdict? Yeah. So Laura, you want to tell them? All- sure. Okay. I mean, I think Kelly and I uh, were a great team. It was my, my first trial was really excited. Um, I did mock trial in law school and I loved it. And I know it doesn't happen as often, but in my naivete, you know, I was super excited to do it. And so Kelly was very fortunate, or I was very fortunate that Kelly let me do opening statements. I was able to direct our client, which is the plaintiff. And then I cross-examined the corporate representative. How long do you do an open for a bench trial? I think you- I had planned for about five to eight minutes. Oh, I was going to say it was quick. There's shorter the better. When I started, Judge Miller was like, I know what's going on. Just hit, Miller was that gay. Hit the bullet point. So I think probably less than three minutes. And then, and then did you handle close? I did, but okay. I didn't even really get to do a close. Sure. He was just like. Security's got to be out by 530. And so I'm just standing up there. I'm like, I'm getting ready to go. Every time I like put up a slide to say something, he was like asking a question. Or what about this? And what about you guys submit this? And it's, so a, it's, it's, a, it's a totally different world yeah. between a jury and a bench. It reminds me of doing a jury trial in Judge Hittner's court. Because you, you'll be halfway through crossing a witness. And he's like, hold on. And then he'll start crossing the witness for you. You're like, whoa. Like it's, so you got to adapt quickly. I like the judge aspect of it because... I mean, you get straight to the meat and potatoes. Quickly. How many witnesses were in the trial, all told? Um, so there was a former employee who we called first, um, the doctor or her surgeon, the podiatrist, our client, her son. He was 21 years old, and he was fantastic at basically talking about all of these issues that um, his mom had experienced as a result of this. Um, so we put him up and then our client and then the owner. So I, yeah, five. Did they put witnesses on? They, they called the owner. The owner. Again? So, no. Or they, in mid? Call him. Okay. So, uh, huh? so they called him in their case and then Laura crossed him. What do you say there if it's 1%? You know, if it's a featherweight light. Is he everything? Is he a monster? I mean, like, what do you what, do? What were, the def- what were the defensive theories that they... Um, one was that she was not in the course and scope. So that's obviously a big one with these injuries. But, but if that's not decided on summary judgment, what are you fighting about? Let's find a bunch and a bench trial. Um, right? We actually, yeah. I mean, that was, that was the main issue, I think, in the case was because she was hired as a leasing consultant who essentially does marketing and tries to find individuals to buy these vehicles. She was not supposed to be closing this gate. And so their argument was it happened right when they closed. She was off the clock. It wasn't her job. Therefore, she's not in the course and scope. So Judge Miller asked us to do some post-trial briefing on that issue. But the law is very clear on that, that she was on the premises um, I mean, they've had cases where on the premises at their direction, they're all getting for other ends of their yeah, yeah. business. It's to it's to close this gate so that people don't come and steal these vehicles. So we felt pretty good about um, the force and scope argument. That was really their only argument. 
other than they had a lot of testimony about that the gate never came off the track. And we have a pretty interesting Say an argument about, about liability at all. They were just denied, denied, denied. Sure. Um, well, a couple of questions, because I have no idea about this area. Well, mm -hmm. genuinely, um, how do you know when you have a non-subscriber case? So you can actually, the Texas Department of Insurance website um, will document. So Because you have to elect like mm -hmm. intentionally to not cover, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and you have to report to TDI and you can look it up in yeah. a minute. So a lot of times I will get pay stubs from people if they're calling in just to make sure to get the real name of who their employer is. Um, and then you can put uh, the date of the incident and it'll show if they actually subscribe or not to that time. more first compensation at that time. Well, let me ask a dumb question. When you guys all agreed to a bench trial, mm -hmm. was there any sort of agreement as to limiting the appeal? It's what are you going to appeal? Well, so so that's so that's my question. If the bench is the fact finder, is the is the appeal like really kind of a lot less complicated the, than it normally would be? The judge considered evidence and then and then that decided not to allow it in, but wrong. still consider it. Or just done that this all happened. They, they are, are appealing. appealing. Under do have they filed it? They filed a motion for new trial, which was. Um, by law, what, what at least, yeah. Well, what was their theory on the new trial? Um, th that it was excessive. It doesn't matter. It's all, it's all, it's all nonsense, right? Um, A new trial is like anything. No, I know, but there's jury misconduct, jury tampering. There's no jury. Excess. <laughs> right. That's what I'm trying, that's what I'm trying to say. Like, what do they ask? I mean, they could put down anything there, right? Excessive damages. Yeah, yeah. D damages and with no... Basis. What, like, it's like, so it's like, Judge, here's a motion that you're wrong. Okay, uh, so how long have you been practicing law? I got my license in October. I got my license in October of 2022, so it'll be two years this October. So you're like four years in, and you've got like a multi million dollar verdict. Two, two years in. You're five into it. I just and I look so much more mature, and I carry myself with the four years. I get that a lot, which is interesting because Bill actually behaves much more immaturely than he actually is so like it like balances like it's how it's all about who you surround yourself well, with that's why they sat us next to each other yeah. and let me tell you this yeah. so i didn't know this at the time but big mean attorney over here i said laura you want to help me on this trial and she's like sure she, said, she was getting married the weekend after didn't even tell me she didn't complain one minute she prepped this whole you know trial with where was me. the honeymoon and i was like i probably would have had to move my wedding date. I mean, she didn't. If the honeyman was anything other than Galveston, you're fired. I can't. I can't imagine what Kelly got you as a wedding gift. Where was it? Where was so expensive? So, Slovenia and Croatia. Nice. I know this sounds. You guys were in a boat. You did. did. I knew it. I knew it. I love trial. Like this. Sure you do. No, I. Because you're a psychopath. A like bit. the rest of us. Hey, hey, bit. do a couple more. You'll stop loving it. Trust me. A little bit. And so I was so excited. I again, like I was just. Oh my God, I get to it's go fun. and do this. It was to be so fair, fun. when it's going exactly like you planned it, which it sounds like it went exactly, it's yep. the most fun. So it didn't, and, and I hope we get to talk about that. Yeah, go for it. Okay, so wildest thing that's ever happened to me. It's like a movie. It, it, this trial well, was a movie. Okay, tell me. Okay. You've so, got like four minutes. Four minutes, yeah. Okay. okay. Um, so about a year and a half before the trial, I had deposed multiple people, but this it, the senior leasing consultant who had hired our client so it was my client's first day on the job and the oh, senior shit. leasing consultant was there with her i deposed her about a year and a half ago and she said nothing wrong with the gate ever never came off the track <clears throat> and on the evening she actually closed the gate and there was no issue with it because your and client's so, an idiot so we were like okay so but we still felt we had them on no training, no policies and procedures. So I wasn't too concerned about like an instrumentality aspect or the gate not working. Um, but about two days before trial, I was talking to opposing counsel. I was like, are you going to call these people live or are you just going to play the defo cuts? And he was like, well, she's a former employee now. She didn't have great things to say about the company. So I'm just going to play her depo. And I was like, well, we're going to call her live. Yeah. yeah. So I was like, um, can I get her number? You know, just 
And so he sends me her phone number. Laura comes into the office that morning and I said, just on a whim, I was like, let's just try to call her. What are the chances she answers? She answers. Um, and I get her on the phone and I said, look, I deposed you about a year and a half ago. I know you, you didn't really remember much about the, the date and uh, just wanted to see if, if you remembered anything. And she was like, yeah, uh, or can I meet you in person? I need to talk to you. And I was My name's like, Marie Antoinette. I want to talk about 2018. I was like, oh, sure. Where do you need, need to meet me? I mean, I don't know. Um, but anyway, she ends up saying, basically, um, the gate fell off the track that night. We had so many problems with that gate. The owner knew about it. It fell, oh. it fell on me. It fell on other employees before your client's incident. It fell on vehicles. It had to be repaired after your client's incident. Oh, and by the way, I have evidence to back this up. I'll send it to you this evening when I get off of work. And I'm like, ooh, what? Yeah. You're like, have you ever been to Slovenia for a Yeah. Yeah. So, That's what takes you from 450. Well, that takes you from 450,000 to 4.5 million. Text messages between her and the owner oh. about the gate. Um, and then she had photographs of the gate broken. Um, so I immediately forward them to opposing counsel. The minute I got them, I formally produced them. Yeah, I might have saved those till like the pre-trial bench trial fucking conference. I would have. I was like, I wouldn't have saved. I would have done it right in the middle of trial. And if they throw a fit and say it's your client, why weren't these in your disclosures? Uh, these are witness statements under one ninety nine or one ninety two. Yeah, yeah, for oh, yeah. sure. And we got um, we got some of those texts in and the photographs. Um, and so it was, That's since bad. we called her first, yeah. live, the former employee you know what I'm saying. who got on the stand. I didn't know. So I didn't subpoena her. And my boss was actually like, Kelly, that is a bad move. Lee. And I'm, I'm glad knows Scott. He was like, you should subpoena her because she's not going to show. And I said, I know, but I didn't want to scare her. Uh, and I felt like I had a good rapport with let her, her as far as she went. let her show up. And she did. And I was like, oh, She's here. And, and so she crushed those people. And the judge actually said, well, why did you lie in your depot? And she's like, I basically that the owner them. had kind of Pressure. told her, if you don't testify like this, you're going to be out of a job. Ooh, that's how you get, that's how you get the, it was the owner, another million. He was, was present. A, okay. Yeah, Did, when they called him, did the owner try to re, like nope. to negate what he had said? He did. He denied everything. Um, the photos, you know, I, sh I showed him the photos of the broken gate, and the, there's a text message seven days after the incident that says the gate is being repaired. He then pulled out of nowhere that it was a different gate, the property, um, which you know he thinks he's being clever, but. You're having repairs done to the gate. He thinks he's clever, but he does not know the people he's going up against. So, so does it, when you're taking these cases and they're not subscriber cases, do you have to have a target defendant that it does have the pockets to pay something like that? Obviously, because there's no coverage, and so yeah, I mean that's a lot of liquid to have as a small business. And I was going to ask Kelly if she's got a shout out for any collection attorney she may be working with on I collecting so their check. We do have a post collection judgment attorney, uh, Patrick Yarborough who's working on this case for us. And so he's handling all of that. We don't really do that, but um, I know he's definitely found some things that he feels maybe are a glimmer of hope or confidence as far as collecting on this, obviously, you know, with the appeal pending, but um, so we're moving forward and just going to see what happens. That's awesome. Yeah. I actually learned a lot today. So um, <clears throat> it's interesting because like we said, everyone shies away from arbitration, plaintiff lawyers, um, or bench trials, but it's a lot easier to put on a case in front of an arbitrator who's a lawyer for a yeah. judge who's a lawyer. And the jury is so, everyone, you know, the judge has to be so protective about it. I spend a lot of time educating a jury. Yeah. Right. And so I assume that's one of the reasons why y'all are totally fine, um, either with a bench trial or an arbitration. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I, I think especially with a non subscriber, just because of like the no contrib. Um, that's sometimes hard for juries to kind of understand because that's not something they ever really hear about. You know, they do motor vehicles, everything else. So, um, especially with different, yeah, normal life experience. Yeah, sure. exactly. So we were like, this is, this is fine. We'll try it to the bench. And 
Uh, we know that Judge Miller is very smart and he understands the law and non-subscriber cases. And he look- was the drum major at the LSU Tiger <laughs> Marching Band. Really? Why do you know that? So he'll tell you. He'll, he'll Why do I know that? Yeah. Because I... He's he Judge like he talks about heart was in the Michigan market. I'm just shocked that Judge Miller would enjoy your company to uh, share that. In any event, <laughs> real quick, real quick legal question: all, with all the defenses stripped, what is the? I think I know the answer. What is the most common way that defendants will try to defend these cases with the uh, law not in their favor? Um, so I, I think not course and scope. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, because did, if didn't happen at course and scope. Yeah. How about causation though on the injury? I see that a lot. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Whether everyday use? Yeah, no. I'm saying like if some maybe has a pre-existing back injury, or uh, you know, you're saying they that this always come up. Yeah, that's yeah. the that's what I typically. Say. What percentage go to trial or an arbitration hearing versus settle? Because there's not really an incentive for a non-subscriber to settle because it's coming out of their own pocket. So I feel like they probably press the limit a little bit more than what I do. Well, a lot of them, a lot of the non-subscribers are the big companies that are, they're basically self-insuring this. So okay. They've yeah. got the assets. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, they're like Walmart, Amazon. I have a bunch of cases against Amazon, Home Depot, Target. I mean. You'd be surprised. The sell- there's, there are SSRI policies that are like up to the first 50 and then there's huge policies. Yeah. So, so I would say my answer to your question, Bill, for a lot of the companies that she's already named, mine go to trial 90% of the time. Really? Yeah. Same with y'all, kind of, what, what what percentage you feel like go to trial versus actually can come to a settlement agreement? They're not scared of a giant judgment, although you got one, you got a great one. In my in my case, my, in my cases, they're not necessarily, not necessarily scared of a big verdict, and so they always go to trial. Well, hopefully we get some more of these. Well, why don't you ask Kelly? Yeah. <laughs> Since we did. I, Kelly. I might say 60, 70%. Go to trial or settle? Or settle. Oh, so 60, 70% settled. That's still huge. I mean, I'm at yeah. probably 1% go to trial now for me. You have a bad attitude. Nobody likes you. I think it's a bad reputation. I, mean, so I, I think- would say probably 30 to maybe, I would say maybe 30% or so go to like a final hearing or end up, you know, if you're ever in state. Which is, which, that's still a high amount. Yeah. How are you, I mean, you're doing a handful of years. Yeah, in one yeah probably, I would say, what, four I mean, between the firm, not me personally, but I would say firm probably does four to seven or so. We, we've had at least five, probably probably in the six yeah. by now. Okay, so where can they find Armstrong Lee, Lee and Baker on the internet? Yeah. Or Victorin and... That's right, Gomez. Gomez. Gomez Duarte. Victorin and Gomez Duarte. Duarte. Is it an AL, LGDLB law firm? Uh, yeah, so it's, um, I, I know it's armstronglee.com, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, we'll take you there. Yeah, so. Okay. Yeah. And then, um, yeah, I was going to look it up. I thought it was. And then, like, yeah, y'all keep getting these and they will, maybe they'll start settling some more and won't be so eager to avoid these small I know, well, I'm hits. Well, I like arbitration agreement. I don't want it. And I'm like, let me look at it. I'm, I'm okay with that. <laughs> to be fair, all the rest of mine are coming to you guys. Right. Do y'all do any comp cases? No. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, lawyers out there, if you have a case and you don't, not sure what's going on with the arbitration provision, maybe it applies, maybe it doesn't. Even if it applies, send it to Peter. And if Peter never did out, send it, <laughs> not send it to me. I'll mediate. No. What we do is we call Peter. We say, Peter, what do I do? And then he goes, Oh, I just mediated one with somebody with Kelly. Send it to her. Like, yeah. <laughs> Thank Peter. you guys so much for your time. We would love to have you back. I, I feel like there's a lot more to talk about on this topic, but yeah, I have a lot of questions still. Kind of running out. No, well, I appreciate you guys having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah. And we can congratulations on your verdict. Congratulations on your marriage. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, that's great. And Kelly, by the way, is married to a firefighter. So yeah, you are. Have you? Yeah. He would be. He, he's way cooler than I am. And he should listen. He's win every career day over me for my. I know. Career. Same with it. He's gonna win over everyone. Did he listen to our last episode? No, I with Marty. Marty liked it was on here. Yeah, yeah. We, yeah Marty was Marty he's every awesome. firefighter question. We're, yeah, we're like we're doing our best to support the firefighters. Yeah, we're gonna do we're gonna do a, a calendar for the dirty verdicts. We're all gonna dress like sexy firefighters. Oh, we're gonna so. Kyle's, Kyle's getting a spray tape. <laughs> We're going to scrap like, actually firefighters. Probably be a lot of it. 
minimal cosmetic surgery. Anyways, it's going to be great. You guys are going to love it. Thank you so much for coming down. Appreciate you. I appreciate it. Thank you, guests. And uh, if you like this or you want to follow us, you can like, subscribe. You can go on YouTube. We're up over a thousand subscribers. Let's get it up. Thousand subscribers. You if you're the twelve hundredth subscriber, Kyle's going to give you twelve hundred dollars out of his own personal account. I think for being any subscriber over a thousand. TikTok, Instagram, uh, Twitter. And maybe Facebook, Spotify, Apple Podcasts. Yeah, well, you're, you're, you're yeah. getting better. Spotify, you're getting Apple better. Podcasts, Chaos Theory Digital, Amanda Orr, or Strategy Group, Como Mediation, Ferriball, Herbert Trial Law. We're at. Oh, solid. Finish. Nine. Thanks to my. Stall's really fun.